Sometimes I'm not sure why we have to go to all this trouble to decorate for Christmas when we just have to pack it all back up again in a few weeks. Hey girls, check this out. Grandma gave me a box of her parents' old ornaments. They've been passed down from several generations. Some of these are over a hundred years old. Oh yeah, look at that. Hey, you can you can look, but and just be careful, okay? Yeah, there you go. Well, I'll be. What do you know? This is a letter from my grandfather. When he was overseas, he was serving as a soldier in the Korean War. Hey, listen up. This is cool. Dear Caroline, Merry Christmas from the 38th parallel. Wow. I can't believe it's December already. It seems like only yesterday that we were deployed. The weather is cold and rainy, and they're saying it might snow this week. But even if it does, it won't feel like Christmas without, without you and the kids. I miss you all terribly. The fighting has slowed some over the last month. They're saying our airstrikes are starting to wear down the enemy. I'm hoping that it will all wrap up soon. The only thing that keeps me going is picturing you guys at home, getting ready for the holidays. I hope you got the extra money that I sent last month and were able to get those gifts for the kids that I wrote about. I know Eddie will love the baseball glove. <laughs> And hopefully Elizabeth will like her crayons and coloring books. Hey, that's your grandma and grandpa. Marvin in the mess hall says he's going to make us something special for Christmas dinner. He's probably just going to serve the usual mystery meat, but with ketchup instead of gravy. Ooh, doesn't that... Yeah. Whatever it is, it can't compare to what you usually make. Roast beef, mashed potatoes green beans, fresh baked rolls, and pecan pie. Just thinking about it makes me hungry and even more homesick. I'm still having trouble sleeping at night. I lie on my cot and try to relax, but I can't turn off the sound of gunfire and grenades in the distance. Even when there's no fighting, my brain is still full of the noise. I'm proud to serve, and I know we're doing good work over here. But it's still hard to understand the why of it all. Especially this time of year, when everyone is singing carols about peace on earth and goodwill to men. But all I can see are violence and chaos. The worst part of this whole experience is knowing that there's a chance I won't make it home at all. Our regiment had, has already lost four men, and nine more soldiers are stateside in the hospital with injuries. They're in the hospital. Oh, dear. I should not be writing that. I know that that will upset you. I'm sorry. Just keep praying for me and all the guys over here. Know that you're in my heart, and I love you dearly. Give the children kisses and say hello for me. Merry Christmas, sweetheart. Love, Earl. Oh. Merry Christmas, guys. Love you. Well, I do think as you get older, you more and more have this nostalgia toward Christmas. You also have a reality that Christmas doesn't always operate the way you want. And the things you want are peace and people not to fight all the time and people to get along. And there's some chaos. In fact, this morning we're going to talk about how God, the, this Father Christmas, enters into our chaos. Before we do that, we had a little chaos uh, this morning. Um, uh, 
So apparently somebody checked in their kids and didn't get a number, so the number system's not up here. So we got a couple kids melting down. So not mean to embarrass anybody, but there's no way to communicate it. So uh, whoever checked in two kids, last name Judd, um, they do need uh, some help for a moment in there in the middle of chaos. So let me open us in prayer, and then we will uh, we'll dive in today. Father, we thank you that you are the God of uh, peace. And God, you enter into our deepest longings and our deepest needs. And Father, uh, we just ask that you would uh, help us. In, uh, in the middle of our chaos moments, God, to trust you and find you and uh, discover you as comfort, as strength, as peace, as joy in the middle of the, the real life situations that we're in, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Christmas, as you know, it's a time of busyness, but it can also be a time of loss, a time of remembering those who maybe aren't around the fire with us. And maybe it's not just a, a great grandfather or a, a, a grandfather, maybe it's a husband or even a child this Christmas can make it very hard. And sometimes Christmas, you kind of see the nostalgic Christmas of everybody, you know, putting all the stuff on and getting along. And like, my kids don't get along when we do that. Nobody wants to participate. Somebody wants it done a certain way. There's a whole bunch of crisis. And, and there's just a sense that things aren't right. And sometimes in the middle, all that busyness and all that chaos, God can be really easy to miss. That's actually what we're talking about today, that God can be easy to miss in the middle of all of this. All of this chaos, all of these expectations, all of the kind of running around. But that's not just true for us today. That's actually been true even from the first Christmas. God was really, really easy to miss in the middle of the actual Christmas story. If you look at the passage, there's several things going on in Joseph's life that imply that this is not an ideal circumstance. This is not the Christmas you and I would hope for or wish for. Look what it says. It says, all this was done. Now what is the this? Joseph's about to divorce his wife because he found out she's pregnant out of wedlock. There's chaos if Rome is in charge of the world. Relational chaos. There's expectation chaos. His whole kind of lineup for his life is falling apart because he was going to plan to be with Mary. Now he's thinking about getting, you know, breaking off the betrothal period. All of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord. God is right in the middle of this chaos. Because God had said... The virgin will be with child. You don't feel like you're in the middle of God's plan, but actually you are in the middle of God's plan. And God is hard to miss, but there it is right in the middle of the verse. The Lord, God, is right here in the middle of your chaos. God can sometimes be hard to find. And if you're not sure really if God even gets involved, maybe you think he's kind of wound up the universe and doesn't get involved, it's even more hard for him to miss if you don't even think he does. So whether you're trying to find significance or a higher purpose or make sense of it all or where's God in all this, we have those kind of questions. And sometimes trying to find God is like trying to find where's Waldo. I mean, you know, have you ever been to a concert or met somebody at a concert? And you're like, hey, uh, we'll see you there. And you're like, you, you get there and it's like, you know, 10,000 people there and you're trying to call and text and figure out where everybody is. God can feel that many times. Like, I cannot find where he is in the middle of all that. In fact, this is an Ed Sheeran concert. If you've ever been to an Ed Sheeran concert uh, and maybe you're waiting to get in the door, you might find that there's kind of this annoying guy dressed up like Spider-Man who's always trying to say hi to people. Like, get away from me. I'm trying to go see Ed Sheeran. But what you may not realize is that Ed Sheeran, the big guy on stage, the person you paid the money to see, likes to dress up like Spider-Man. And he likes to go out in the crowd beforehand where he can kind of mingle and get to know his fans incognito. So Ed Sheeran, it's not hard to miss when he's on stage. But he's really hard to miss when he's dressed up like Spider-Man. And Christmas is the same thing. It's about a heavenly father who's on the grand stage of heaven. But he steps into our world. He steps into line with us. And when he does that, when he steps into that line, he's dressed up as a full human being. And he's connecting with us. And he wants us to know that he is a new type of father A father who enters into our chaos. He steps into the battle lines. He gets into the difficult circumstances for us. So that's what I want to look at today. Like, how do we not miss God? Two ways that we can look and find this God in the middle of our chaos. Number one, you got to look alive. And number two, you got to look up when you feel confused. Now, what do I mean by look alive? Do you ever have a coach used to say that? Well, I did. In fact, I remember, I don't know if your kids or grandkids ever played t-ball or, or, or sort of playing softball or baseball and you're sitting on an outfield where the ball never goes out there. You ever seen this? And, and here's where your daughter or your son is at. One, two. And you're like, hey, get up, get, get up, the ball's coming. It hasn't come in like two days, they have three games, they're not coming. And, and so our coach is like, yes, you got to look alive out there. 
Look alive. Now, what is it that can make you look alive in the Christmas story when you're in the middle of kind of boring circumstances or difficult circumstances? The Bible says, look alive. You have a father who can bring clarity and control to your chaos. Even though it feels like it's out of control, there's a God who is still in control and can navigate even the most difficult of circumstances to his purposes. Look alive. Look up. Have some confidence. Look alive. Because there is a God who brings clarity. Even if you don't understand it, I'm going to clear that up. You're going to see in a few years what I was doing there. He brings control. When you feel out of control, at least I know my dad's in control in the circumstance. But to understand, to really look alive, you're going to have to go through some steps. One of those is that our first instinct in circumstances is to look around. And you look around at stuff and you're like, this is not the way it's supposed to be. This is not the way it says it's supposed to be in the commercials and the movies. So look around. And what did Joseph see when he looked around? He didn't see things he liked. He didn't see a lot of clarity. He didn't see a lot of control. He looked around and saw what? The woman I'm betrothed to, before we've come together, is pregnant. And she's got this whole, I'm pregnant with God's baby. Right. I mean, this is devastating. And maybe you're looking around at your life and you're saying, this is devastating. This is heart crushing. This is excruciating. I don't see God in any of this. That's exactly where Joseph would find himself. He doesn't look alive. He looks like the life's been sucked out of him. And yet, as the passage goes on, it says, then Joseph was minded to put her away secretly. He's looking around like, man, the things are falling apart. While he thought about these things, the putting his wife away, the relationship's falling apart, my life's falling apart, while he was thinking on those things looking around, it was then that God stepped into the story and said, let me bring some clarity. You think you're out of my will? You think God has left the building? No, 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 no. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in that moment to say, you're on track. God is here. You're part of the greatest mo- moment of God's working in human history. So be careful when you look around that you only see the circumstances that you don't like. And God may want to bring some clarity to say, no, look alive. Uh, your heavenly father can bring some clarity to this. And, and often, God's will can often be seen better through the rearview mirror than through the windshield. You've got to look backwards to see what he did do in order to understand what he's going to do. It's very hard to see clarity where you're at. And that's exactly what the angel tells him. Hey, look back. Look at some of the promises I made. And one of the promises I made, which was that a virgin would be with child. Huh. Look, do not, do not be afraid. Fear is what's driving you. I want you to move forward into what you have. I want you to take her. And I want you in the future, she's going to bring forth a son. Look at all these future words. And when he brings forth a son, you shall call him. And he might be save people. All these things are going to happen in the future that God is doing in your life. But in order to understand the future, you've got to look back of what was fulfilled in the past. There's a promise God gave in the past that you need to anchor into your present in order to move into your future. What is that promise? It's from Isaiah. Jump back hundreds of years. That a virgin would be with child and bring forth a son. And his name shall be Emmanuel, which literally means our father's with us. So he's in the greatest moment in history when literally the father has become the son and is with him. And he doesn't feel like God is with him until God brought clarity and reminded him he's been in control of this storyline for 500 years. Now let me jump back to Isaiah. So it's interesting, this quote here in Matthew comes from Isaiah. And in Isaiah's day, there was a lot of turmoil and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of difficulty. In fact, many people who question the Bible or question Bible prophecy would say that this idea that the prophecy from Isaiah that says a virgin will be a child is just nonsense. Because the word virgin or the word used for virgin in Hebrew can mean just a young maiden. And they're right, actually. It can just mean young maiden. Or it can mean a virgin. And Isaiah picked the perfect word because in the Bible, there's times that things have a double fulfillment. They apply now in one way and they point to an ultimate fulfillment later. In Isaiah's day, there was a lot of difficulty and a lot of challenges. And he was saying, hey, for you guys in your current circumstances, God is going to reveal himself by a young maiden is going to give give birth to a child that's going to bring some hope to you, a a leader in your day in the next couple of years. And so in one way, there was a child that was born to a young maiden in the days of Isaiah that brought hope to the people. 
But like all other leaders, you know, he failed in many ways and didn't bring a final uh, restoration of all the kingdom. So the word that Isaiah picked was the perfect word that applied to the current hope they needed in Isaiah's day and an eventual final fulfillment of an actual not just young maiden, but virgin young maiden that would give birth to the God child, the father come to earth. That there is a God that is Emmanuel. He wants to enter into your pain, both in Isaiah's day and in your day as well. God with us. This last October, we had a vacation together, and so my my daughter had her one-year anniversary, so she and my son-in-law came along on the vacation. We did a multi-generational vacation. It was either going to be good or horrible. It turned out to be really good. So they're celebrating the one-year anniversary. My dad was celebrating his 70th birthday, so my dad's there, my mom's there, my daughter's there, my son-in-law's there, and my wife is celebrating her... uh, her 30th birthday. Yeah. Again. Again. So, so we're having a great time together. And so while we're, while we're there, we decided to go sailing. And when we decided to go sailing, um, I'm like, uh, hey, you know, I've been kind of learning to sail the last couple of years when I'm in different places, these little kind of small sailboats that you know, get two to four people on. I said, I'd love to take you guys sailing. So Sierra's on there and Brandon's on there and I got the sailboat. And my dad says, hey, can I come? I said, oh, sure, come along. He says, by the way, Jed, did you know I sail? I have never seen you sail. Like you're 70. I've never once in my life heard a sailing story. I've never seen you sail. You're a fisherman. Now, I, I'm a boater. So there's a big difference, by the way, if you don't know fishermen and boaters. So if, it doesn't, if you're not skiing behind it, you're not boating. So, so my dad and I always having battles between the fishermen's stories and the real boating stories. But no, now we have something that we can bond together on sailing. But I'm like, Dad, you do not sail. I sail. When's the last time you sailed? I was like, well, back in... Uh... 69. I mean, he didn't, whatever it was, I, it was decades ago. So we get down, we're having a great time. We're sailing along. My dad said, do you, do you mind if I take the sail? I'm like, I think I do. Uh-huh. So I step back, my dad's got the sail, and what I realize is when I've learned to sail, it was actually in Nantucket, in a harbor, and in the Keys, where it's a harbor, I have never sailed in the ocean and my goodness, the difference. I can steer, I can turn, but three foot waves were hitting and my dad's got the wave. I'm like, Dad, I've never done this kind of thing. And my dad's, wait till you see this turn. He throws the thing on. You don't want to do that. Turns us around. Now we're heading back toward the beach. And there is no wind in the sail for about two seconds. And it is like somebody puts a, an outboard motor on our sailboat. We start taking off. I'm holding on to stuff. Sierra's holding on to stuff. Brandon and I are holding on to stuff. Things taking off. And I realize we're no longer sailing. We're surfing. He has caught a wave. It is, am- I mean, it is amazingly out of control. And he, I'm looking at him like, he doesn't look nervous. He's, I mean, he's surfing us along on this wave. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. And so, so here I am, nervous. Can I trust Dad? What's Dad doing? Does Dad have the experience for this? Do I need to grab the reins? It turned out there was a power source available to me in, in this moment I didn't even know was, was possible in my sailing experience. And it turned out my dad did a pretty good job. It turned out my dad knows how to sail. And it turns out he, I hope he, he might be watching this right now. He might be a better sailor than me. But, no, no, <laughs> but I think this is the same experience we have with God when we go through circumstances. We see waves, things we never encountered, the unknown. Does God have the experience for this? Should I take the rain? Right? But God wants to enter into our world. He's the kind of father who steps into the waves and brings his experience to us. And that's what he's doing with Joseph here. Look alive, Joseph. You've got a father who steps in. I can navigate these things with you. Trust me, even when you don't understand it. I was talking to my father-in-law last year. He goes by Butch. His name is Dewey. And we just started talking about the war. I said, what made you decide uh, you know, your service in Vietnam? Tell me a little bit about that. We've talked occasionally about it. A few things I learned this time I didn't know before. He said, well, Chad... Did you know that, uh, well, he didn't say it. I said, well, tell me, like, how'd you end up in Vietnam? He said, well, I enlisted. I said, well, I've heard a lot of people drafted. You enlisted. Oh, yeah, I was the first to enlist. My father had served in World War II, and I wanted to be on the front lines. He goes, I went through the whole testing thing, and I got some pretty high marks. I was a mechanic, built, you know, worked on tanks and things like that. But I had such high marks that they said that they weren't going to put me on the front line. They wanted to keep me in the back room. And I said, no way, I want to be on the front line. I said, you, wait. You chose to be in Vietnam, and then you had a chance to be in safety, and you chose to be in the front line. Yeah. I said, Butch, that is amazing. I mean, that is amazing. That is such an honorable, brave, courageous thing that you would choose to put yourself in harm's way. He said, uh, well, I didn't say it was very smart. 
I said, I didn't say it was very smart. I said it was courageous and honorable. And my goodness, if I think about the years of PTSD that he has suffered, the challenges that's given him, um, one of the times when he went to serve, he actually was held back to finish building a, 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 finish fixing a tank, and everyone in his platoon died except him. Everyone. And I think about the cost of my father-in-law fighting for my freedom, stepping into the battle zone, stepping into the, just the chaos of life. I'm like, my goodness, with a huge cost to him, and huge cost to his ability to you know, fully connect the way he would want to or need to. But that's the kind of father we have at Christmas, the kind of father that steps into the chaos and steps into the difficulty, and steps into the battle zone for us. He's honorable, he's courageous. And he wants to bring clarity and control to our confusion that we can know we have a father like that and we can truly look alive because of it. And what if that was your application today? What if you could act confidently like God is with you? Because that's what Joseph does. He acts confidently as if God is with him. Look what he does. You see action words. He looks alive. He's feeling maybe dead inside, but he looks alive. God's told me he's with me. He's with me. Look what he does. Being aroused from sleep, what did Joseph do? He did. He acted. He acted confidently, just like the angel told him. And he took his wife, just like God told him. Did he fully feel like it? He acted like God was with him because he believed God was with him. He looked alive. And he did that. He did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son. So even then, I mean, just imagine nine months into your marriage and you haven't consummated the marriage yet because you're trusting that God is fulfilling a promise. That is a tough sacrifice. And then they had many, many children after that and Jesus had several brothers. But he acted confidently like this God was with him. This is a God who steps into our world. Remember when I was in Atlanta, I was training on my replacement. I was apprenticing a creative arts director who had come after me and her name was Megan. She was in her 20s at the time. And we were talking about kind of her story and what God had done in her life. And I said, what are some of the moments that you just felt God's presence? And she said, I'll tell you exactly what it is. I was 15, 16, 17. She said, I was a teenager, and I'll never forget, my dad and I went out in a boat together. We were fishing. My dad was a big, famous professor at a Bible college. And I was scared to death as we were fishing. And finally, I got the nerve, and my dad said, what's going on? And I told my dad, I said, Dad, I, I'm, I think I might be pregnant. And I could just see my dad's sadness. I could see my dad waiting for condemnation or a big speech. And my dad looked at me. He said, well, honey, I'm here with you. And that moment, my dad being in that boat with me in a time of confusion and feeling like I disappointed him and disappointed you know, what he stood for, what he had taught me. And, and we talked in the boat that day and we got out of the boat and my dad said, well, tell you what, I'll take, we go with you. Let's go to Walgreens together and let's get a pregnancy test. And my dad walked into Walgreens with me. We got that pregnancy test. And I remember my dad was with me when I tested and I found out that I wasn't pregnant and I didn't have to wrestle with the questions of you know, giving the child up for adoption. You know, I didn't have that, but my goodness... My dad had told me, wherever we are, he was with me. He was going to walk with me through this process. And I was uncertain. It was confusing. It was felt out of control. But that was the moment God showed himself the most was through my father being with me in a moment of chaos. It's the kind of father God we have. He's a chaos entering God. And when you feel, when you experience a God like that, a father like that, you look alive. Even when you don't always feel alive. So look alive. Secondly, you look up. When you feel confused, the Bible says, look up. I mean, think what the wise men did. Oh my goodness, we're trying to find where God's at. Your father is your father is the kind of God who's here in the confusion of where. If you're going to have this Christmas season or this year some where moments with a big old question mark, boom, where is God? God said, lean in and you're going to see I'm here. I am here, Emmanuel, in the middle of your and often we say, well, wh- where's God at? Wh- where's God at in this? Where's God going to p- provide in that? And that's you see the wise men. The wise men have been following this star, whatever the star is. We talked about the star a few weeks ago in our Galileo series. I did the equipping service in detail. You know, it might have been an angel appearing as light. It could have been some alignment of plants. It could have been a meteor or supernova. Whatever it is, they're following God's leading. And then the first question when they get to Jerusalem is, where? And if you looked at the Roman world, Herod's a tyrant, the Romans are tyrant. I mean, there's just chaos all over the, the Western world, all over the, the world in the Middle East at that time. And the first question says, where? It's he who has been born king of the Jews. We saw a star, but where? And they have to go to the promises of God in the Bible 
to say, oh, it's Bethlehem. They're seeking God. They're curious. They want to know. But the question is, where? And God says, I'm here. And God ends up providing promises from the Bible for them to navigate that. But if you're Joseph, you're like, where? In fact, after the wise men come, Jesus is about two years old at this point, which is why Herod's going to kill the two-year-olds, which is just a horrible part of the Christmas story. And if you're, if you're Joseph, you're hearing an angel now say, someone's trying to kill you and your child, run to Egypt. Where is God in that? And yeah, we escaped. Where is God in the other children who didn't make it? Where? And yet if you read the, the story real closely you can see God's fingerprints in the middle of the where. Herod called the wise men. Again, Herod's a tyrant, just a brutal, brutal dictator. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. So God has now led them through some scripture, through a star, through these things. God has brought them here. So now the where questions turned into here question. And when they get here, look what happens. They offer him... Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These treasures. Then, now having received Joseph the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Wow, here's where God is. Then an angel appears to him and says, Arise, take the young child mother and flee. And you went from here's God to where's God again. We're going to a land we don't want to be in. A land that's known for bondage of our ancestors. Where are you sending us? But look how God was working in the middle of it. How in the world are you going to finance two years in a foreign country with no job, not knowing the language? Here. God used the generosity of the wise men, the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh, as the financial backing they needed to funnel and fund this two-year CIA escape route from King Herod, the richest man probably in the world at the time, maybe even in human history. So God was even here providing in the middle of that circumstance. So you may not know where God's at or how he's going to provide, but I'm telling you, God wants you to know he is providing in ways that are in the background. Sometimes you won't see it for months or years. Other times you just got to hold on to a promise. Other times you got to say, God, where are the ways you might be working that I haven't realized? But God is working in the background of these stories. And God may want to do the same thing for you. You may be on the receiving end. I'm saying, God, I, I need to know where your provision is coming from. Or maybe this Christmas season, you're on the giving end. The, the, like my friend Megan, she felt God's love through the love of her earthly father. Maybe you like, you're the wise man in the story. That God wants to show his love and his generosity to some Joseph, to some person in your life. And you're going to be the conduit for that. It's your giving of gold. It's your giving of frankincense. It's your giving of myrrh. It's your giving of service. That is how God communicates his love to real people living in the world. You can be part of the story. And maybe you want to do that here in our community. We've been giving out blue bags and, and presents for, for Happy Church and, and City Gospel. It's just an amazing outpouring of generosity from our church. And people are going to feel God's presence through the, the gifts of God providing through our community. There's so many ways in which we have seen the outpouring of love this year at our church. And some of those have been in some of these Herod moments. We have had funerals here in this room this year that have just been heartbreaking. Just heartbreaking. Walking with families, walking with widows, walking with dads. Emmanuel and God with us. We have had moments of celebration and laughter. We've had people baptized over here in the little Miami River as holy as that water has ever gotten, I'll tell you that. We have had children and adults baptized in our adult baptism service who have not even had pastors baptized them. They've had a, a small group leader or a mom or a, a, a dad baptize them and said, you know, this is who's influenced me spiritually. And Sunday school leaders or exp- uh, East Station leaders who just had a privilege of baptizing children. I talked to somebody this week who's been in a Bible study who said, you know, I started this Bible study. I was an atheist. And because of the love I've had, because of the conversations we've had, I'm moving along the way. I might consider myself a deist, but I'm open to the things of God. It's amazing how, through the way we serve people at services, Easter services, Christmas services, the way we serve people when they come in for funerals, when they come to baptism services, or or child dedication services that we do, or just our regular services, it's our generosity of giving of our time, giving of our money, that allows us to be the hands, the feet, the voice of God, just like the wise men were here, where people feel God's presence through real people who follow God. 
Ethan, we've talked this year about our video projects, amazing things that the teams are working on this week. We've got kind of some updates on that. And this is the way many of you are serving. There's so many volunteers involved in the team and it's still open to more. Many of you have volunteered in our children's ministry to be part of creating an environment for folks. We got our licensing uh, approved this week, so exciting. As I talked about going to live stream, we have an app. If you weren't here last week, you can download our app at Horizon Space CC in the Google Store or in the uh, Apple Store. There is so many resources on there to help you. There's a Bible study tool on there, Blue Letter Bibles on there. There's a, 10 years of messages, verse by verse, in our book by books thing to help you grow spiritually. And then, and here's the big news, because we got our licensing approved this week, we're actually going to be able to offer our Christmas Eve service on video demand. Let me tell you the difference. Live stream means you can watch the service while it's happening. Hey, I'm not here. I'm on business trip. It's 10 o'clock. I can click on the app and watch the service exactly in real time what's going on right now. Video on demand means it's not live, but the next day, the next year, you can actually watch any of the services. And because of the licensing of our team that's been working so hard behind the scenes, you're going to be able to watch the music and the message, which has required unbelievable amount of work by our team, so that you can then send the message with the service directly to friends, to neighbors. You can watch that with your family. So for Christmas Eve, we do not have live stream for Christmas Eve. We have video on demand, which means the next day on Christmas Day, starting in the morning, you'll be able to watch our Christmas Eve service. So if you're not here, you want to watch that with family and friends, wherever you're at for Christmas, that's going to be available. And that will continue in January. And somewhere in January, we'll move over from video on demand the next day after the service to live stream. You can watch it during the service. So very, very exciting. And these things have come in place, these tools, these things, because of your financial giving and because people continue to come here and say, boy, I feel God. I've learned the Bible in ways I never had before because what God is doing in this place. God often shows his provision to us through other people's generosity like the wise men. And you see this so often in just ordinary, regular examples. I don't know if you guys saw the NFL draft. There was a Skype call between Josh and his father. Did you see this? This is amazing. So Josh Jacobs' uh, dad got on a Skype call on the NFL draft night and just, he began to talk to his, his son. He says, son, man, we've been through a lot. He just talked about the challenging times and the times of impoverishment and the times of difficulty and didn't think we're going to make it, not going to make that team. And Josh was just getting emotional as his dad was reminding him, I have been with you through it all and I am proud of you and I'm here with you in your highest high as well as I was there at your lowest low. It was powerful. And that's why we do what we do as a church. We want people to know, we want you to know this Christmas in your chaos, in your battlefield, in your difficult, God is with you in the middle of it. And he wants to kind of take you back through time to remind you the way he's been working through the ups and the downs and the difficulties. I don't know if you saw the tweet, I think it was last week or last month from Deion Sanders talking about the role his father's played. Big famous Deion Sanders Jr. talking about his dad who's so famous. He says, you know, my dad prioritized me coming to games. He said, in fact, there was one time I had, I had a game and dad wanted to come see me, but he wasn't able to get there if he drove. So dad took a helicopter. Let me just read the tweet. Fun fact, I had a basketball game in seventh grade. It was 5.30 and the game started at 6. My dad was at his house an hour away, but he wanted to be there. Right before the game starts, my dad lands a helicopter on the football field so he could be at my game in time. People went crazy. Deion Sanders, who prioritized his son. So much so he got a helicopter and came through like helicopter sky to be there. That's the story of Christmas. Famous God made the universe, made the world. Wow, it's God. Helicoptered down to land in your football field, to sit in your stands, to cheer you on, to watch your game, to be in the midst. So look up when you're confused. God wants to enter into your story. And that's our takeaway today. You look alive and you look up because you can be confident. What, what if you acted confident? What if, what if you took your current circumstances, your current difficulties, you said, you know, God is, is hard to miss in the middle of all this. He is. It's hard, it's, he, I mean, he's easy to miss in the middle of all this. He, he is easy to miss. But what if I say, even though it's easy to miss him, I'm going to act confidently like an all-powerful, all-knowing God has already figured it out. How would you face your current circumstances If you approached it, trusting that there's a God, an all-powerful, all-knowing God, who's already figured out the things that you can't figure out. That's our key takeaway today. Act like that all-powerful, 
all-loving God already has it figured out. See, the message of Christmas is not a God who comes and makes nostalgic, wonderful, nice experiences and circumstances all the time. I wish that was true. We could sell that. It's a God who enters into the battlefield, a God who sent his son to surprise us in surprising moments and difficult moments and challenging moments. And there is something so powerful when you read the main message of the Bible is that God sent his son to surprise us so that he could expand his family. He's inviting you into the family. He wants to have a giant family reunion. In fact, the book of Revelation ends that way with a giant wedding feast and family reunion saying God surprised me, showed up there, surprised me, showed up there, and I joined him in his family. Maybe God wants to surprise you in your circumstances. Entering the battlefield for you and I. Let's pray and I want you to see what that might look like if you experience it today. Father, thank you that you have served on the battle lines like my father-in-law, like my grandparents. Thank you you want to serve on the battle lines with each person, whatever they're facing this holiday season. And God, as you step into those battle lines, you want to surprise us and let us know that us being in your family is the most important thing this holiday season. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I really haven't seen him since I joined the Army, not just the deployment. Um, so I think that I actually get to spend time with him now. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's my mom, my dad, and then my three younger brothers. It, it's kind of like a family thing. They would normally watch the game every night that it's on. You know, they'd all sit down and watch it together. I don't think they've actually been to a Blackhawks game as a family together. So this, this will definitely be a first for all of us. We're outside at gate four, getting ready to head in. My family still doesn't know. We were about to cut for a commercial break, so that's, that's when this is gonna happen. They're sitting like right over there, I have no idea. I just want to say hi to my family from Afghanistan, let you know that I love you, I miss you, and I'll see you soon. Oh yeah, by the way, go Hawks! been talking to him and, and we hadn't gotten a two-week call that he was coming home. We hadn't gotten the one-week call. You know, we had no idea what was going on. It was very emotional to have him back for Christmas. We were worried that we wouldn't have him back by then and knowing the whole family is going to be together and all the boys together and that he's home safe after all this time is very special. To be a part of actually giving them this kind of surprise is really, really amazing. Not everybody gets a chance, obviously, this big to surprise their families. In fact, uh, a lot of guys, specifically some people that were in my battalion, didn't get to come home at all. This isn't just about me or my family, or it's about everybody else that didn't get to come back. We are so glad you joined us this morning. Uh, we'd like to remind you that uh, we'd love to see you on the 24th, which is coming up uh, a week from Tuesday. So uh, we'll be here. We hope you'll be here. There are tickets available in the atrium for the eight identical services. They're at 10, 11, 12, 1, and then 3, 4, 5, and 6 o'clock. If you're going to come, be sure to pick up a ticket for everyone in your party, including kids, so we know how many people are going to be in each service. And we're also going to have the, uh, our standard uh, equipping and exploring services the, the weekend prior on the 21st and 22nd. We'll really look forward to seeing you on the 24th. Have a great weekend.